and welcome back to Inside the Vault, episode number 45. I'm your host, Ryan Smith, uh, here on this Carolina Panthers podcast. My guest today here is a Panthers beat writer. Uh, she certainly knows her stuff. She uh, is also a frequent appearance on the Pat McAfee show uh, whenever he gets her on there. Um, follow her on Twitter at Sheena underscore Marie three. Sheena Quick, welcome to Inside the Vault. How are you? I'm good. How are you today? I am doing good. Well, so good to have you on. Um, for those who just may not be aware, let's just start with your background uh, summary of kind of what you do with the Panthers. You've, I know you are a beat writer. You, you've been on, you know, Queen City Live. You've got a lot of different uh, avenues that you kind of go off of. So for those who may not be familiar with uh, what you do and kind of how you cover the Panthers. Well, um, I'm going into my ninth season and I'm a multimedia journalist covering the Panthers um, for Fox Sports 1340. And as you mentioned, I'll make occasional uh, appearances on a couple of other shows. I was doing the game analysis. I was a guest analyst on Queen City News for the last three seasons, but um, I won't be doing that this season. But th that's kind of the gist of, of what I do. I cover this team on a day to day basis, as well as off season transactions, uh, drafts. Pro Bowl, just different things like that that go on outside of Sundays in the fall. Gotcha. Um, let's talk about the Panthers offseason and draft kind of in, and give us your summary of kind of what happened this offseason. Uh, some good things that you liked, some things that maybe you thought could be improved, but just your overall, you know, 4,000 foot view on this summary of this offseason. Um, I think that this offseason – went as well as it could have possibly gone um you know a 2 and 15 team is not fixed in one off season there's a constant state of almost like a, a turnstile of coaches and philosophies and schemes that these guys have had to learn over the last 3 years or so and so with that you know there's the money side of it the business side of it the bills the the deals that didn't get done in time some transactions that people would have liked to have happened some transactions that people would have liked to have gone differently in terms of talent exiting the franchise. Franchise. So I think that with what Dave Canales and Dan Morgan had, I felt like they played the hand that they were given as best as they could. Um, again, this isn't going to be a one season turnaround. It's, there were a lot of cracks in the foundation of this team, and it's going to have to be built from the bottom up. And I think that they're making the steps to do that. Um, it's going to be incremental. It's not going to be a, a complete overhaul, and this team is not going to suddenly go, you know, 15 and two. I just, I'm right, just right. I'm being realistic. And I think that that part of it and Dave Canales' approach in that manner has garnered the respect of both the players and the coach. I mean, I'm sorry, not the coaches, the fans, because I feel like they can trust him a little bit more. They're not being sold a wolf ticket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to leave last season in the rear view mirror that we're, we're right. looking for, Sheena. Um, you've been down to training camp in Charlotte recently uh, this week, and uh, obviously it's about a week old at this point. Um, what are some of your impressions of camp uh, players who might be sticking out um, in a good way? Um, and then are there any players who might be a surprise to kind of make this roster? Uh, and we'll go through some position groups in a second, but just your overall impressions of camp. I don't think we're going to get any huge surprises as far as the, the 53, the final 53. I think it's going to be who can stay healthy. They had a couple of roster shuffles in the last week, mainly because of injuries and because of Rashad Penny's retirement. And so um, I will say this, that that rece wide receiver group was getting cooked left and right, nationally, locally, Twitter, on social media, everywhere yeah. that you looked, they were being highly regarded as the worst receivers court in the entire league. And I think that they took that personal. They have some new additions in Deontay Johnson, obviously, Xavier Leggett. Um, but Jonathan Mingo is taking that personal. I feel like Terrace Marshall always has a strong camp. So I know that they're going to be the naysayers. They're like, Sheena, you say it every year that he's having a strong camp. He does. He has strong yes. camp. He does. And I had a, a chance to sit down and talk to him because I do feel like I, my style of journalism is a little bit different. You know, I like to sit these guys down and I like to have conversational type of interviews and they know I'm going to keep it real. I'm like, listen, Terrence, there are people that are going to say, yeah, he's having a good camp, but he has a good camp every year. They're going to say, OK, is he going to turn the corner this year? Like, do you hear all of that? And do you feel like you're going into this season with a point to prove? And he said that he does. He has a point to prove to himself to this league, to his teammates. Um, and he compared his experience in Carolina and in the NFL as a whole as being a rookie every single season. And when you look at that, he's had three different head coaches. He's going into year four. He's had three head coaches. 
He started out with Joe Brady calling plays his rookie season. He gets fired midway between the second season. Jeff Nixon takes over play calling. Then you get Ben McAdoo. Then last season you get uh Last season, you get Thomas Frank Brown Reich and Thomas Brown for a yep. couple of games, and then Frank Reich again, and then Thomas Brown again. And when you're trying to find your footing, you're literally being thrown in a culture shock. Like it's like being thrown into an ice bath every couple of minutes. And and so I asked him about that, and he said, "Look, it's, he was like, I mean, there's nothing I can do about it, but I feel like a rookie every single season because I'm having to learn all these schemes. I'm having to prove myself and make this team every year." Yeah. Tom, uh, Terrence Marshall Jr., I, I, if you can go back and listen to some of my previous episodes. I am a fan. I, I, I'm i a Florida Gators fan, so I'll forgive me for going to LSU. But uh, he, I enjoy Terrence Marshall, and I think he can be a breakout person this year. I've been a believer in him ever since we drafted him, and there is no bigger fan of Terrence Marshall than me. I want to see him succeed so badly and make this team as the wide receiver five or six. So. Uh, we'll see what happens there. As you mentioned, there's been some transactions, some injuries. Rashad Penny retired, as you mentioned. Sam Franklin, as we know, is out for a while um, with a foot. And then Angie Dalton just went on um, about a quad, I think, for a couple of weeks. Yeah. And so we'll see what the Panthers sign there. I'm not going to ask you who I think they're going to sign. That's It'll be somebody off the street. We'll see a Trevor Simeon of type, Brian Tannehill. Uh, Blaine Gabbert, yeah, some, somewhere in those lines. So it's a temporary fix there. Yeah. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Um, position groups as a whole, is there any groups that you think going into this season are particularly strong? Um, to start, we'll, we'll get to the weak ones. We all we pretty much all know what the weak ones. But is there a position group that you think is pretty strong uh, going into the season, even could survive some injuries? Um, position they've done a good job for now. I think the wide receiver group, you know, it, it, it's so funny. It, it went from what, you know, highly regarded as the worst unit on the team to it could possibly be the most stable. Um, and the only reason we're not saying offensive line is because these guys are new. This is, this is a new combination of guys. And you kind of could see that in um, the fan fest last night, there were some timing issues, but of course those things will go away as they take more snaps because everyone on that line is a veteran. You have um, Icky who is looking to turn the corner and completely put his second year season, his sophomore season as far in the rearview mirror as he possibly can. Um, he has some strong guys around him in mentorship roles that could that could help him do that. Um, with a commitment to the run, the offensive line could end up being the second strongest unit on this team behind the wide receivers. And to go back to the wide receivers, to add another vet in Deontay Johnson along with Adam Thielen. Adam Thielen is a complete dog. Like, I love Adam Thielen. Adam Thielen did not come here last season to be a wide receiver one and found himself in that position anyhow. So I think that he's the chameleon and he is the uh, the wild card, the Uno wild card of that receiver group where he leads by example. He's going to get open. He's going to give Bryce Young a security blanket of sorts. And that's how you saw him have such a productive season last year. But Deontay Johnson is also going to bring a different element. And I like the connection that he and Bryce Young have had. Jonathan Mingo is having a strong camp. Yes. You know, a lot of people wrote him off after just the rookie season, but a lot of times when you hear the argument a lot that we can't really assess Bryce Young after last season because it was just a comedy of errors. Like no one could really, you can't get a fair assessment of him with everything that was going on. I feel like the same can be said for Jonathan Mingo and you don't really hear it that often, but a wide receiver can't be a stellar rookie wide receiver if his quarterback is getting knocked down 60 or getting sacked 62 times or 63 times, however many times yeah, but six, yeah. or, or times Bryce Young got sacked. And I think that this second year can be pivotal for him as well. So it goes from, oh my God, nobody can get separation to, man, who's going to have to be left off of this team? Amir Smith-Marset. Uh-huh. He's a playmaker also. And I, I had to sit down with him last week and he said, listen, I want everybody to know that I'm a true wide receiver and I can make plays and I belong in this wide receiver rotation. I'm not just a returner. So I think that that numbers wise is the strongest group on this team. And I think that as the weeks go by and these guys get more reps, the offensive line is going to be your second strongest unit. Yeah. And then on the other side, weakest or most showing, uh, the, we'll say lack of depth. We could go that way too. If you not necessarily say weakest, uh, you know, defensive line, uh, particularly defensive end, uh, and corner or two that come to mind in my book, uh, you know, outside JC Horn, another big fan uh, of his, uh, JC Horn. I love him. I hope he gets a healthy 16, 17 game now season. Um, and then defensive end, you've got Clowney, DJ one, I'm starting on the pop list. 
Kadavian Chasen, we'll see. DJ Johnson, we'll see. And then you've got guys down the line like Eculiota and you know you down the Amari line. Bonner. And Amari Bonner. Well, yes, he but he he's coming off the ACL too. So uh, also, well, uh, both Coach Canales and David Clowney last night were giving DJ Johnson a lot of praise. Uh, David Clowney called him I mean, Jadavion. I called him David. Between, yeah. between you know Dallas, look, it's, it's a lot of D's around here. So Jadavion Clowney um, said that DJ Johnson is one of the best edge setters on the team. And he's emerged as kind of a front runner on the other side of Dave, Jadavion Clowney. Um, but that's one of those things that remains to be seen as well. But there's been glowing praise. Canales has had great things to say about him in the last two to three press conferences that he's had after practice. He said that he's coming along great. He's doing everything that they want him to do. He's exactly where they want him to be at this point in the training camp. So um, you just have a look out for, for DJ Johnson. And I'm not sure what the timetable is on DJ Wanham. I don't think we were given one just yet as, to, as yeah. far as to when he'll be able to, to make a contribution, but that edge group is something to keep an eye on. Um, and again, you know, like we, we were talking about the off season and, Brian Burns being traded away. Some people were happy to see him go. They were like, oh, he didn't, we didn't, he deserved, deserved the money he was asking for, you know, this, that, and a third. But then the problem becomes, how do you replace that? Because yep. then he leaves and then you leave, you, you lose uh, YGM on the other side. You, you, you lose Yitor Gross Matos on the other side. You lose Frankie Luva. Dante Jackson's gone. Um, Von Bell, who's a starter. So all of a sudden it's not just, can we replace Brian Burns? It's, there's five starters going from the defensive side of the ball that we have to somehow figure out a way to replace. So um, the, the edge group is something is, is a group that everyone's kind of keeping a really, really close eye on to see how they develop over there. Um, big picture. What does success look like for the Panthers in 2024? We'll get to Bryce Young in just a second, but, um, and, and you maybe can combine that if you want, but um, some people like me think that this division is really bad. And you've got, you've got, you've got Tampa Bay, who is coming off a good season. However, their offensive coordinator is new, and it no matter how much he's played with Baker in the past, it's still a new system. You got Atlanta with a 36 year old quarterback coming off a torn Achilles, and then you got New Orleans, who well is New Orleans, frankly. Uh, you know their defense is getting older, and Derek Carr is. Um, not like he's Kirk Cousins, a little younger, I think. Um, so what he's are your younger, thoughts? Kirk Cousins? He, if he isn't, it's not by much, I guess. It, I think it's, I think he's like 33, 34, I want to say. And Kirk's like 36. He's, he's only 33. I, I, I can look, I'll look that up. Uh, I'll look that up. But anyway, so what are your thoughts on the division this year? I don't think they're going to compete for the division, but there are people out there that do believe that because their division is so bad. And if we have like a, turnaround in one year kind of like baker had last year with canales and bryce has it this year it can be done um he is 33 yes to answer your question uh Derek carr is 33 um so your thoughts on uh competing in 2024 and uh just beyond what does success look like for this team um i do think this team will could possibly compete for the division just because the division is absolutely putrid like we're not talking about the you know the AFC North or anything like that. We're talking about the NFC South, and it's kind of there for the taking. Now, do I think that this team is going to all of a sudden get double digit wins? I don't. But within that league and how close everything is, I don't want to say how how close everything is in the basement because that's just kind of negative. But with it, it's anyone's division. Division is up for grabs, so it can be one bounce ball, one doint field gold and we're talking a whole different you know shuffle of division standings here you know the team was what one in one in five when one in five I think it was one in five yeah I think you're one right in five when, when Steve Wilkes took over and then all of a sudden they're playing and possibly going into the postseason you know they're they're a missed field goal in, in Atlanta away from this being a totally different story and, and possibly different personnel that we're talking about here today so I think that yeah. that division it's been a long time since someone was head and shoulders above the other three teams. So that's why I do think that they'll be competitive in terms of how you're going to measure success. I think that that's all subjective when it comes to this team. Um, I'm not a participation trophy type of woman. That's because I'm raising three boys. So I'm, my, my scale is a little bit different than some people's maybe, but um, you want to see 
this team have a chance to win every game. I think that that's going to be a measure of success. It, there were times last year when a team went up seven points in the second quarter and you knew that the Panthers could not score and that was all that was going to be needed to win that game. I think that fans want to have something to enjoy watching. They want to have something that they feel like is worthwhile them spending their money on these tickets, these PSLs, these tailgates, these tra the, the travel and things like that. So I think if you can put a quality product on the field that's going to actually compete, that's a step in the right direction. But to, I don't think any everyone's cautiously optimistic. Right. Listen, uh, last year, people were ready to book their Super Bowl tickets based off of the propaganda that everyone was sold in the off season. Oh then, gosh, oh, yeah, don't get me started on that. Coming, you know, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're we're a quarterback away, and because of all of that and how crazily wrong that went yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of tempered expectations but they want this team to be competitive and they do understand that Rome wasn't built in a day and the Carolina Panthers aren't either I think that they got a huge culture boost in the hiring of Dan Morgan he's one of the only people in that building that is experienced winning Carolina football there's only three players on the at the roster right now that have had a winning season in Carolina yeah. that's ridiculous <laughs> yeah what does success look like for Bryce Young this year specifically? Um, you talked to some people. Um, if Bryce Young doesn't have a good year two, we need to start looking at 2025 draft because, you know, as uh, some people say, it's Thanksgiving year two. They either have it or they don't. Got to start looking. And then some people are like, like you said, Bryce Young wasn't given a chance last year. You know, I don't want to say, I don't want to compare it to the Urban Meyer experience because it was definitely different in Jacksonville, but this is, People almost gave Trevor Lawrence a free pass his, with Urban Meyer, and they, they kind of started over, you know, with Doug Peterson. So, uh, is are people viewing that as this year with Bryce Young kind of in the same vein as kind of like rookie year contractually? Yes, it counts, but everywhere else, it doesn't really count. We're starting over uh, in year two. I think people with good football sense are looking at it that way. I mean, you really cannot assess him on last season. It's hard to think that any quarterback would have had success in those conditions who wasn't named Tom Brady. Yeah. I think that's that's about the only person that could have that could have, you know, went out there and 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 performed well under those, you know, parameters. But with the protection and things like that, um, are you looking for like a touchdown to interception number for Bryce or just an overall what do I think would be would constitute a successful season for Bryce Young? Uh, yeah, either one you want to give me, but uh, what does success look like this year? Success for Bryce Young, uh, he's going to have to make some plays. I know that a lot of people were questioning his arm strength last year because he didn't get a chance to throw a lot of deep balls, but sometimes when that was open, he might have overthrown or underthrown or not connected. Um, and it sucks to have such a small sample size of two throws, you know, per game where you actually, your receiver actually got separation. But Bryce Young's success is going to hinge completely on that offensive line, their commitment to the run game. He might not have gaudy numbers this season or at least the first half of the season because they've made, uh, you know, all of the, in the inclinations that they're going to be a smash mouth football team first. They're going to make teams respect the run. Um, that's something that they were successful with under Steve Young and completely abandoned all last year that really could have helped him in his rookie season. So I do think that we might not see gaudy numbers. It just depends on the scheme. And while wins are not a quarterback statistic, people right. still indelibly link them. Um, and it's just all, and again, it's subjective of what's going to be successful when it comes to Bryce Young, because you got to understand that people are weighing what happened off the field. They're tying that into how to his success and to their expectations. They're like, listen, you traded away the farm and DJ Moore. He's going to have to do X, Y, Z for it to be worthwhile. So when it comes to Bryce Young, there's so many other mitigating factors that are going to go into how people determine whether or not he's successful that don't have anything to do with the football field. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Nope. You know, yeah, it definitely does. It definitely does. Crap. And then with with everyone over the oh, who wanted CJ and who wanted Bryce and was there a schism when it when it comes to you know yeah. all of that CJ had a great season it made it even worse him Bryce CJ and Anthony Richardson are always going to be linked yeah for, yep. for for the the duration of their careers so Bryce Young's success is going to look different to every person that looks at it in yep. my opinion you know that sounds like a really PC answer and I'm not trying to do that at all. Sure. But that's it's going to determine it's going to depend on who you're talking to. Yeah. And where you land does matter. And, and right now, last year, that's what Bryce landed in. CJ Stroud landed in a different situation. And uh, she'll have to be a factor in. 
Um, Sheena Quick has been my guest today here on Inside the Vol as we wind down. Sheena, what's your bold prediction for uh, this team coming up in 2024? Uh, I think they get eight wins. If, if we're if we're if we're you know talking about wins, I think they I think they can eke out eight. Okay, I, I say uh, ceiling is nine and eight, floor is six and eleven. That's my that's that's not a prediction yet. That's just that's fair. based that's on fair. what I that's what I can see. Um, lastly, uh, I, I was going to make this my last question, uh, but I did not. Um, we've seen you pretty frequently on the Pat McAfee show every once in a while. Um, when is your next appearance there? Do you know that yet? Can fans check you out there uh, on the Pat McAfee show and other places where can they connect with you uh, before we let you go? Uh, where are some of the places that we can find you going forward? Well, I actually have no idea when I'll be back on uh, Pat McAfee. I guess the Panthers have to do something worthwhile, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and maybe I'll maybe I'll get the call. But yeah, they have to do something worthwhile, like go out there and you know, blow out uh, the Saints in Week One. If they go out there and blow there out the Saints in Week One, look like a, a completely different team. You know, maybe Pat will have me back on there. But they got to win some games. No one wants to hear me talk about a team that that's you know terrible. That's yeah. been so you know they have to win some games for me to be for me to be back on there but in the meantime everybody can find me on twitter i'm always on there bumping my gums <laughs> and any other uh podcast or any other things you want to tag while we got you um, quick blitz will be back once the season starts that's bash and i's podcast our weekly podcast where we talk about everything going on with the panthers rate outfits and and plays of the plays of the week and things like that look forward give bet, betting odds and things like that so be on the lookout for that also all right. Well, that's a good place to end it, Sheena. Thanks for again for coming on Inside the Vault, and we'll talk to you down the road. Thank you. And that'll wrap up this episode of Inside the Vault, a Carolina Panthers podcast, episode number 45. I'm your host, Ryan Smith. Rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcast, and we will see you next time.